I'm going to talk about the charismatic renewal of the 1960s and 70s. But first of all, I want to just share something with you that, that I'm going to fit in somehow to this thing about the charismatic renewal, which was a powerful Holy Spirit revival that many of you will remember. Um, this is something that, I, that came to me today. Uh, I was praying, Lord, thy kingdom come. Sue and I have often talked about that thy kingdom come is a prayer for revival, praying for his kingdom to come. Because God's kingdom at this time, in this era, is not an outward structural organizational kingdom. It's a kingdom of the heart. It's where God is, is establishing his rule and reign, starting on the inside and touching every area of our lives. And um, so I was, I was praying this prayer, Lord, thy kingdom come, which I, I agree with you. It's a prayer for, really a prayer for revival. Because it is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit and the kingdom of God are, are linked together because it is the Holy Spirit that advances, who is at work in the earth to advance and to move ahead God's purposes, God's plans, God's kingdom. And I was praying, God, thy kingdom come. And I heard something. I'm accepting that it was the Holy Spirit that was very real inside of me. These words, you can't pray thy kingdom come while going about to build your own. Now, I felt it was a you, a, 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 a you plural, inclu sure, including me, but including all of God's people, the church. You can't pray thy kingdom come while going about to build your own kingdom. Well, you know, the Holy Spirit comes in what we call revival, to advance God's kingdom and purpose in the earth. And then people, churches, and religious organizations get involved and often, too often, then try to use what the Holy Spirit is doing to advance their own agendas and build their own religious kingdoms. This always brings death to a movement for the Holy Spirit is not here to prop up and sustain our man-made religious kingdoms. The Holy Spirit is here to advance God's purposes, God's kingdom. So if we are to see the fullness of revival, and revival is, is merely what we call revival is the work of God's Spirit advancing God's rule and reign in the hearts and lives of people. And if we were to see the fullness of revival and the true advancement of God's kingdom, we as God's people, we must lay aside our man-made plans and agendas and receive His plan and purpose for our lives. The charismatic renewal was a mighty work of the Holy Spirit. Nobody could have planned it. Nobody could have planned that and made it happen. I, I remember, you know, when I first became aware of it, I was uh, in my early 20s, uh, newly home after three years in the armed forces and uh, had recommitted my life to Christ. And I'd grown up in a classical Pentecostal church and denominations. And, uh, and Pentecostals had been persecuted by all the other churches. The, the Methodists, the Baptists, the Presbyterians, they had all rejected the Pentecostal revival at the turn of the century. Every once in a while we would know of somebody from one of these churches coming over and, and wow, getting baptized in the Spirit. And so we as Pentecostals, we thought we had a monopoly on the, the Holy Spirit. That if anybody was going to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they were going to have to come over to us. Well... We begin to hear about Baptists and Methodists and Presbyterians and Episcopalians being filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and many people were skeptical of it, didn't, didn't think it, it could be happening without them coming over to our side. But it was a tremendous move of the Holy Spirit. It seemed that just suddenly these, these charismatic prayer groups, and, and they got the word charismatic because... At first, they called themselves, and others called them Neo, which is Latin for new, Neo-Pentecostals, the new Pentecostals. But they didn't consider themselves Pentecostals because most of them were staying within their churches. 
So somebody, I think it was Harold Bredesen, uh, coined the name charismatic from the Greek word charisma. And Sue wants me to give her my phone. I just heard it beeping. And uh, so Sue, if you want to, if you want to come. Jan checked in from Calgary. Ah, Jan up in Calgary. God bless you. Eva and Norval Rover from here in Grapevine are on for the first time tonight. Well, super. And, and Claire is on. Claire Ortega okay. is on. Praise the Lord. That's wonderful. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Yes, there you go, Sue. Yeah, welcome all you new folks on. So glad you're here. Um... I believe it was probably Harold Bredesen, who was a Dutch Reformed minister, coined the term charismatic from the word Greek word charisma. In Paul's letters, which he wrote in Greek, he used the word charisma, or the, the plural charismata, when referring to gifts of healings, working of miracles, prophecy, messages in tongues, interpretation, all of these... He referred to them as the charismata, plural, or charisma, singular. And so someone, probably Harold Bredesen, coined the, the, the term charismatic to refer to all of these people from these denominational churches who are having similar experiences that Pentecostals were having 60 years before. And so uh, now these churches, some churches became full-blown charismatic, but what was happening in many cases, it was like charismatic prayer groups were forming within churches. And uh, the leadership of the churches, be it Baptist, Methodist, Episcopal, they were allowing this, tolerating this, and the people would have their smaller meetings in some part of the church, weekly meetings, and they would get together and worship God and, and allow the gifts of the Holy Spirit to flow and with tongues and interpretation, prophecy, praying for one another and all of this. And this movement just literally exploded all over the world, the United States. As I say, no human being would even have thought of could have ever planned it and strategized it. Well, it was actually during this time that I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, spoke in tongues, and after this, I began to experience the Spirit of God moving in me in other ways, in, in gifts of the Holy Spirit, experiencing His power in my life. And then shortly after that, I went off to Bible school at Christ for the Nations, which was a center of, of, of this charismatic renewal. And Christ for the Nations had its roots in old-time Pentecostalism, and then, but they, then the, the Lindsays had been leaders in the healing revival, which we talked about last week. But now they became a center of this charismatic renewal and people were coming from everywhere. When I went there, there were uh, the school was new, but there were about 400 students and they were from all different kinds of backgrounds and denominations. And uh, as my friend Bill Fish, I don't know if Bill and Melinda are on tonight, but Bill just, uh, he posted a thing to my, on Facebook. He said, uh, yes, uh, I remember it well. He said, one thing I remember was there was rarely a mention of denomination. There was such a sense of the Holy Spirit and of Jesus that people didn't talk about their denomination, what they were. There was an aliveness. People were alive to God. And just before I went to Bible school at Christ for the Nations, I remember there was a, a big gathering in, in Dallas in 1972, in the summer of 72. And uh, tens of Thousands, mostly young people, converged on Dallas, Texas, and, and it was written up in the newspapers and in Time Magazine, made the front page of Time Magazine. And every day for a whole week, they were in places of businesses, witnessing about Jesus on the streets and in places of businesses and restaurants. And uh, fill the cotton bowl, 80,000 people every night, five nights. And at the end of the week, there was a, a concert on an... Uh, a freeway that the city blocked off for them, 150,000 people there. Well, it was really an incredible time. And I can remember as a student at Christ for the Nations, just some incredible moves of the Holy Spirit taking place. Now, this, by the way, this did not happen. There were some precursors to it. I want to just mention a couple. And, and one uh, is a person who became very well known. Another is a person you've never heard of except some of our friends up in New Brunswick. 
And uh, first of all, I will mention this person who is unknown that I believe had a part in helping pave the way. And, and I believe there were many like her, and there are many like her today. And I'm telling this story to show how important it is. Sue, your little statement. What is your statement that you... Doing my small part in God's big plan. Doing my small part in God's big plan. Your, your part, it may not seem very big, but it's like a piece of a puzzle, say a thousand piece puzzle. If we all respond to the Holy Spirit and put our piece where it's supposed to go, where the Holy Spirit take, tells it to go, then eventually it's going to develop into this beautiful picture. So, Sister Manetta Rosbro, when Sue and I met her, she's a little old white haired lady, probably in her late 70s, maybe 80. And uh, she was known around town as the Hallelujah Lady. And she wore her hair back in a bun, and she was kind of bent over, and she kind of had a little bit of a shake. And she was always saying, Hallelujah. And, and people called her the Hallelujah Lady. She was an old-time Pentecostal, but she just lived a life of prayer and in God's presence. And uh, she told me that this story. Uh, it was... Years before the charismatic renewal broke out, God put it in her heart to go to the big Catholic cathedral in downtown St. John, the seat of Catholicism in that area and where the bishop resided, and to go into the church. She'd go there during the day. Nobody was there, but she would just go in and she would pray for the Catholics. This little old Pentecostal lady, she'd pray for the Catholics. Go there regularly, just go in praying for them. Just doing her little part in God's big plan. And she told about that one day she was in there praying and the bishop was there. <laughs> and so, I don't know if, if he approached her or she approached him, but anyway, they came together and she was talking to him. And she said to him, Do you people believe in the writings of Peter? And the bishop said, Why, yes, he's our first pope. She said, Well, you people must be backslid then because you don't live according to his writings. <laughs> Well, she's just a little old white-haired grandmother, so what can you do? <laughs> so they talked some more, and she gave him her card with her name and address on it. Several years later, she got a call from him. He was in the hospital there in that city. And she went over to talk to him. He asked her to come. He asked her to come. She, he, got, he called her, asked her to come. And she went over and talked to him and prayed with him and led him to Jesus. <laughs> little old white-haired Pentecostal lady. Folks, doing our little part in God's big plan. Now, she lived to see the answers to her prayers because there was a, an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that broke out among the Catholics there in St. John, New Brunswick. And I know Sue and I attended at least one of the meetings there. She took us to it because when it broke out, I mean, she was a regular attendee there. And not only would she uh, get up and encourage them, but she would get on their case about smoking <laughs> and different habits they had. <laughs> and, 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 of course, what could they do? She's this little old white-haired grandmother. <laughs> but, but what a powerful influence she had, and no doubt her prayers and, 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 and her witness helped pave the way and open the way. No doubt for the, the charismatic renewal in that part of the world, but who knows where else. God gave her an open door and allowed her to confront some of these things. Gave her favor because of those hours of prayer and compassion. Yes. She loved the people. Yeah, that's right. It wasn't so, that she came down on them hard. She loved them. Oh, that's right. Yeah, she, she, she really cared about them. And some of them did her also. Yes. And uh, there, there's some, some funny little stories out of that, but we, got, we have to keep moving. Uh, the, the other person I, I wanted to mention was David Duplissy. Why don't you, before you leave Manetta, why don't you tell them how she prayed for our little Volkswagen? Yeah, Manetta, uh, Manetta, she just was here and there. She just visited all the different churches around, and then when the charismatic movement broke out, she was all in all the charismatic meetings and, and, and giving testimonies, and, and pr she's a great prayer warrior. And uh, Sue and I were at a cof Christian coffee house one night. This is shortly after we married. This has been many years ago. And uh, she went with us. 
And we were driving a little, or no, I think she was there and she needed a ride home. That's what it was. And I was driving a little Volkswagen Bug that had just been in an accident. And the insurance had just written it off and totaled it. And, uh, but it was still running. It was the only thing we had to drive. But after the accident, it was very hard to start. I had to just pump the gas pedal continually to get it to start. And then to drive it, I had to drive it just continually, fast as I could, pumping the gas pedal to keep it running, uh, or it would die if I stopped pumping the gas pedal. And, and it was still very jerky, bumping and jerking along like this. So we're giving her a ride home. And we're going along, and she's in the front with me, and Sue's in the back, and, and I'm there, I'm pumping the gas pedal as hard as I can, and the little bug is jumping and jerking along. And Sister Minetta says, what is wrong with your car? <laughs> well, I, I didn't think there was any try to explain I said, oh, this car needs prayer, Sister Minetta. Pray for this car. Well, she just laid her hand up on the dash of the car, and she began to plead the blood of Jesus over that car. Now, it's been like this for some days ever since the accident. I had looked at it to see if there was anything obvious that could be done, but I couldn't see anything. But when she laid her hands on the dash and began to pray, plead the blood over that car, that engine suddenly smoothed out, began to run smooth, never missed again, never had a problem, in fact, Sue and I drove it all the way back to Texas, and I remember two, over 2,000 miles, and I remember driving along the interstate. And if you remember, the engines were in the back, and at the back, were a 18-wheeler had hit us in the back. It was just crushed all around the engine. <laughs> and I remember that little bug just sailing along, running so smooth, hitting on every sim cylinder, not missing, and we drove the whole 2,000 miles back. Wow. What an incredible miracle. Folks, God cares. God cares. He cares about you tonight. Mm -hmm. And as we just step out in prayer and pray, just trusting Him, looking to Him, who knows what God is going to do? Who knows how God is going to answer our prayers? Will what... What an incredible, what a, a powerful thing that was. You know, probably as far as publicly, the charismatic renewal, historians usually trace it back to uh, probably 1960. There was a Episcopalian pastor, Episcopalians, same as the Anglicans in Canada, in the Revolutionary War, when America split off with Britain, the Anglicans in America changed their name to Episcopalians. Well, there was an Episcopalian rector or pastor named Dennis Bennett in Van Nuys, California, pastor of St. Mark's Episcopal Church. It was a high church, liturgical type congregation. He had a hunger in his heart and there was... There was a prayer group that met together, and somehow this prayer group had come to into a realization of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and they invited their pastor to attend, and he did. And lo and behold, he, he, he was baptized in the Holy Spirit. But he didn't tell his congregation because, you know, people who spoke in tongues, they were these wild-eyed Pentecostal fanatics who swung from chandeliers and rolled in the floor and all of that sort of thing. So, you know, he didn't... I didn't hear Margaret O'Healy. <laughs> <laughs> so he didn't... He let it go by for several weeks before he told anybody. But one day when he announced it in his church, there, there were people who wondered they could tell something had happened. And so here he was in all of his vestments and robes and everything. And when he told about that, he had had this experience of the baptism in the Holy Spirit and he would spoken in tongues... Right in the middle of the service, his associate, who was already a little upset with him, but didn't know why, he pulled off his robes, threw it on, threw it on the communion table, and said, I can't work with this man anymore, and walked down the aisle and out the church. <laughs> After the service was over, people were in the foyer, and, and some people, you know, they didn't know what was going on, but they were supportive. Other people were very upset, and one man was overheard cursing, 
and, and, and saying, kick the so-and-so Pentecostals out. We're not Pentecostals, we're, we're, we're Episcopalians. <laughs> and it caused such a hubbub and such an upset in that church <laughs> that he wound up leaving that church. <laughs> yeah, yeah, actually, I think his superiors moved him out. And he was sent sort of to the back side of the desert to Seattle, Washington, to, to an inner city church that the diocese was considering closing down because there were only about eight people left in this inner city church and they were thinking of closing it down, so they sent him there because they figured he couldn't cause too much problems there <laughs> since they were going to close it down anyway. But in that situation, he felt, he felt free to talk about and preach about this newfound experience of the baptism in the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues and gifts of the Holy Spirit. And lo and behold, revival began to break out there in that church in Seattle, St. Luke's Church, which is still there and pastored by a... Oh, I don't think John is and Holly are there. You don't think they're there anymore? John and Holly Rodden, Rodden. Yeah, they, they, were, uh, they were there up until just recently, yeah. uh, I know, and Holy Spirit filled people. But anyway, so he felt free to preach this message, and lo and behold, revival broke out in this inner city Episcopalian church. And uh, somehow, well, somebody told me who it was, I can't remember her name, somebody sent in this story, some influential person to Time Magazine, and Time Magazine carried a story in April 1960 about this Episcopalian priest and his congregation that spoke in tongues and prayed for the sick and all of this. Well, lo and behold, when this came out in Time Magazine, there were, come to find out, there were hungry people in these denominational churches all over America. And people began to flock to St. Luke's Church from all across America, and it became a real center of renewal. And of course, out of that, the, the, what they call the renewal. Now, one reason they called it the renew, a renewal was they, they preferred the word renewal because revival to their ears sounded a little more harsh. And they emphasized that, you know, this was not to start a new church. This was to renew the existing churches. So one of the big emphases was stay in your church. <laughs> I remember hearing denominational people saying this over and over, stay in your church. <laughs> And so they preferred the word renewal because they believed that the Holy Spirit had come to renew the existing churches. That was true, but you can never keep the Holy Spirit within a denominational box. You can't keep the Holy Spirit within an organizational box. Well, uh, as, as this thing began to flow, there were tensions between the old-time Pentecostals. Now, many old-time Pentecostals accepted it and, and moved with it and benefited from it, but some didn't. And I remember... Uh, being back home, this was after in the 1970s after Sue and I had married back for a visit, and there was an old-time healing evangelist that had, that had been an associate with A.A. A. Allen and worked with A.A. A. Allen alongside uh, 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 R.W. Schambach. Him and Schambach had been like younger protégés of A.A. A. Allen. And uh, Harry Smith had went out on his own with a tent and uh, become a healing evangelist. Well, he was up in his 70s at this time. Somehow he would gotten to know my parents and he happened to be visiting the service when we were there. And I think somehow he had people got this idea that, that I had become a charismatic. I remember one woman saying, Lisa, I have heard back in uh, that my church there, my parents said, I've heard you're charismatic, which, which meant, I, I mean, you've left, you've left us all, you've gone off us. <laughs> Folks, I have never been into names and titles. We... <laughs> No, no, that was somebody else. That was uh, uh, Reen, Reenie. <laughs> but for them, that meant I had, I had left my roots. I had left my church. I had left and, and gone off with this strange new group. <laughs> oh, hey, I'm, folks, just following Jesus. I've never, Sue and I have never been to names. I, I like a message by, by George Whitfield I got in my new book, you know. That's what Sue is doing, getting this ready for the printer. We may be able to send it to them tomorrow. I believe this is a God thing. I can hardly wait for it to, to, to get back from the printer. George Whitfield, who was an Anglican, was preaching, just elaborating on this thing about names. 
and the, the large open air crowd, thousands of people in colonial America, which was very divided between the different groups and, and uh, uh, denominations and theologies and so on. But he was getting groups from all different denominations coming to his meetings. And so he had this, he, he simulated this conversation with Father Abraham who was looking over the, balcon the balconies of heaven. He cried out, Father Abraham, are there any Episcopalians in, uh, up there? And the answer came back, no, no Episcopalians up here. Well, Father Abraham, any Baptists up there in heaven? The answer came back, no, no Baptists here either. What about Presbyterians? No, no Presbyterians here either. What about Catholics or Quakers? No, none of those here either. <laughs> well, Father Abraham, what kind of people are there in heaven? And the answer came back, there are only Christians in heaven, only those who are washed in the blood of the Lamb. And, and then Whitfield in his sermon, he cries out, oh, is that the case? Then God help me and God help all of us to forget about names and to live as Christians in deed and in truth. Hallelujah. And that is so true. So true. Well, uh, oh, Harry Smith, he said to me, <laughs> some of these things are so funny. He said to me, because he knew I guess I was having some, uh, some interaction with these charismatics. <laughs> He said, well, I'll tell you what. He said, these charismatics may be getting the Holy Spirit, but they're not getting the Holy Ghost. Is my friend Valerie Owen on tonight? Valerie, I know you'll love this one. <laughs> yeah, that's what he said, this old-time healing evangelist. He said, I'll tell you what, these charismatics may be getting the Holy Spirit, but they're not getting the Holy Ghost. I said, Brother Smith, the Holy Spirit and the Holy Ghost is all one and the same. That's just how the King James translated. Oh, no, it's not either. They are not the same. <laughs> he would not be convinced. In other words, he, he had something those charismatics didn't have. <laughs> kind of kept him up on a, a little higher status. Folks, there's always a problem when we try to put ourselves above everybody else. Well, we've got this experience, so we're just a little bit more elite than everybody else. Be careful of that. This charismatic renewal broke out in the Catholic Church. In uh, uh, the University of Duquesne, up where our friends Bill and Melinda live, broke out in the, uh, on a weekend and, and then spread. And I remember when I was at Christ for the Nations, I believe it was uh, Frida Lindsay went to a conference at the Center of American Catholicism at Notre Dame. And there were 30,000, probably the great majority would have been Catholics. And she was so, because she was from a, a Pentecostal uh, tradition. And here were these priests dressed up in their robes and nuns and everybody singing in the spirit and tongues and praising and worshiping God. And uh, so this charismatic renewal was just sweeping Throughout the earth, it was an incredible time. Some of you uh, remember that. Many ministries that we know about came forth during this time. Some of them are not here anymore, but Bible schools and colleges like Christ for the Nations, Rhema Bible Training Institute, uh, some of the television networks like the, the Trinity Broadcasting Network and like uh, Pat Robertson and some that are not here anymore like Jim Baker the, uh, and PTL. And so on, and uh, just all kinds of ministries springing up out of this charismatic renewal. Now, the question is, uh, what happened to it? Now, let me just back up a moment. It was one of the things that was emphasized in this renewal. This re it was a revival. As I said, many of those preferred the word renewal. Revival was too harsh to their ears and sounded too Pentecostal. And uh, they wanted a renewal of their existing structures. Um, I used to have a videotape. I lost it. I pray it's going to turn up of a uh, probably the watershed event of the charismatic renewal. 1977, 55,000 people filled the Arrowhead Stadium, football stadium in Kansas City, Kansas. 55,000 for this charismatic conference. About half of them were Roman Catholics. About 25,000 lower, but the other 25,000 were Episcopalians, Methodists, Baptists, Mennonites, even um, Messianic Jews and, and from all different walks of life. And they came together and it was, it was an incredible thing. The big 
emphasis. You listen to the speakers, Catholic, Protestant, Mennonite, whatever. Their big emphasis was unity. They believed that God was, was pouring out His Spirit to bring a unity in the body of Christ. And, and it really did seem that way. One of the participants there was, was a, a Roman Catholic cardinal. Uh, and cardinals is the highest you can get before you get to be the Pope in the Catholic Church. His name was, was Cardinal Suenens of, of Brussels, Belgium. And he had been baptized in the Holy Spirit and he spoke in tongues. And, and he was there and, and sat on the platform with old-time Pentecostals and different ones and, and, and was one of the speakers there. Spoke briefly at the conference. And anyway, he called this charismatic conference in Kansas City in 1977 the most impressive ecumenical manifestation of our time and declared it to be the realization of an impossible dream. You know who borrowed that was Vanita. I wonder if she gave it back. Vanita, if you're on... Do you no, she, 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 she didn't remember uh, getting it. I'd ask her about it. She didn't remember it. Okay, listen, so, while I'm bur bursting in here, Ken and Karen in, in Northport, Alabama are on. Uh, and Ken just put, uh, sent an email through. He says, tonight is bringing back some great memories. I, I was just a kid back in those days, but we had some exciting experiences. You just never knew who was going to show up in a church and get healed or who was <laughs> saved. There were a few nuts that kept us in the cave, but most were sincere saints. Yeah. In fact, some of the nuts were actually sincere too. <laughs> good word, Ken. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. Thank you, Ken. Ken and Karen of Northport, Alabama. Good word, Ken. Amen. Amen. That's so true. Well, um, talk, talking about this, this unity. But then it seemed like after this, it began to fade away. It began to decline. What happened to this incredible renewal that seemed to be doing something? There was this, you know, the World Council of Churches had been trying to bring unity for years. Couldn't make any headway, very little headway. All the Pentecostal denominations and the evangelicals had totally rejected the World Council of Church. It would have nothing to do with them because they were so liberal. And they made very little headway. But all of a sudden, here's something happening. This is why this cardinal said, you know, it's the most impressive. Ecumenical just means a, a, a unity of coming together. The realization of the possible dream. Because here's something that has happened that nobody wasn't trying to make happen, and all of a sudden it's happening on a level nobody would have ever imagined possible. Could it be possible that the Holy Spirit was at work advancing God's kingdom? But then, as I was mentioning earlier, what, what is it that so often happens? Let me read this again. This is what the words that came to me today. You can't pray... Thy kingdom come while going about to build your own kingdom. The Holy Spirit comes in power, what we call revival, to advance God's kingdom and purposes in the earth. People, churches, and religious organizations didn't get involved and too often then try to use what the Holy Spirit is doing to advance their own agendas and build their own religious kingdoms. But you see, we must never try to use the Holy Spirit. We must yield our lives completely to Him and allow Him to use us. If we are to see the fullness of revival and, and the true advancement of God's kingdom, we must lay aside our man-made man plans and agendas and receive His plan and purpose into our lives. And I remember at this 1977 conference, one of the speakers had a word right along this line. In, in fact, I pulled some of, not the words, but some of the, the thoughts from him. Larry Christensen, whom I, he's a Lutheran, I disagree with some of his other writings. But, I mean, he nailed it. And he mentioned how that many people in the renewal were seeing the excitement and vitality of the renewal. And were seeing it as a means of, 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 of propping up and enhancing their own churches and ministries. And he went on to exhort and warn the people that the Holy Spirit was not being poured out to prop up and enhance and advance a human agenda or a human kingdom, but it had come to advance God's agenda and God's kingdom. Boy, that is so true, so powerful. 
Hallelujah. Folks, if we will, I believe if, if, if we will just, many of you out there, I know you already have, because I, I know you and you're sold out to Jesus, but somehow, just catch the vision. God, this is about advancing. You pour out your spirit to advance your kingdom. And we want to do our small part in your big plan. I believe we can see another great outbreak and move of the Holy Spirit in this day and in our time. No, it won't look like just like something of the past, any of them that we've described. But it will be God's Holy Spirit coming in power to advance His agenda, His purpose, and His kingdom. Well, what happened to the charismatic renewal? Why did it begin to fall apart? Well, here are some things, and if you have the manual, if you're working with the manual with me, uh, I'm on page now, on page 122. And if people want it, how can they get it? If they want it, you can go to Amazon and get it, but you'll pay more for it. If you want to pay a lesser price, go to my website, www.eddiehyatt.com. Go to the bookstore, and it's there, along with the textbook that it's a companion to. Uh, where is the textbook? Yep, yep. Here's the textbook. It's it's very worn, but that's the textbook to this course. And we have a few copies if people want to email you directly. That's right. I do have a few copies. Now, fifteen dollars includes uh, the shipping. Uh, but if you're ordering from Canada, I, I would ask you to put in a little extra because the shipping to Canada can be a little expensive if it's over four pounds. So, here are some things that I, I want to mention that I think contributed to this wonderful renewal that people had such great hopes for what was going to happen. And suddenly, it began to dissipate and disappear from the scene. What page are you on? Pardon? What page are you on? I'm on page 122 in the, in the manual. In spite of the original desire for it to be a renewal of existing churches, many people who were part of the charismatic renewal in the Episcopalian, Lutheran, different churches, they began to leave these churches. Why? Well, they felt they were drying up. And so they began to leave these churches. And what were they doing? Well, some of them were going over and joining the older Pentecostal churches. Some were starting new churches. Charismatic churches, independent charismatic churches. And this exodus from these older churches caused much concern with the leadership of these older churches. They didn't want to be losing members. So in response to this, they began to put greater restrictions on the charismatic prayer groups that were a part of their church ministry. And they began to tell the charismatic prayer group leaders that they had to emphasize their own traditions to the people and the importance of their own traditions and the importance of being faithful to their own church and their own traditions. In some situations, they even uh, would no longer allow people who are not a part of their denomination to speak in their charismatic prayer groups. They began to exclude people from other denominations. Walls were going up. In other words, walls begin to go up to protect their turf. In other words, now they're trying to build their kingdom. They're trying to protect their turf and their kingdom. I remember when uh, we were in St. John Sioux and, and uh, the charismatic renewal there among the Catholics. And uh, one of the people there, uh, his name was Fred Farron. He was a Catholic priest and he was the, probably the most prominent leader in the Catholic charismatic renewal. And he would have Protestant and even Pentecostal preachers in to speak in their charismatic renewal meetings. But then there was a point where orders came down from the hierarchy that they were no longer to have non-Catholic speakers in their charismatic prayer groups. And they were to emphasize their charismatic traditions and, and, uh, and liturgies and doctrine. Their Catholic traditions. Yeah, their Catholic traditions. And uh, I remember this Fred Farron, he kind of all of a sudden, he was no longer around. He disappeared. 
And people are wondering what happened to him. And uh, well, maybe he got transferred somewhere else by the Catholic Church. Then we heard that he was in Western Canada, that he had left the Catholic Church, had gotten married, and was part of a, a Pentecostal denomination that had been founded by a woman. <laughs> you talk about a big change, the four square. <laughs> and, and Sister Manetta Rosbro, that I told you about, she told me this other story. She was talking... The Hallelujah Lady. She was talking to a Catholic priest in one of the charismatic renewal meetings. And she had heard from Fred. Fred took a great liking and a respect for her and used to take her to meetings where he was speaking. Well, anyway, she knew what had happened, but she was just testing out some of the people in the Catholic Church, how they thought. So she asked one of the priests, who was one of the leaders in the charismatic renewal there, uh, she said, uh, have you heard from Fred lately? And he replied, I don't think I want to hear from Fred after what he did. You know, of course, it's a terrible thing to leave the Catholic Church. And Sister Manetta, in her <laughs> very down-to-earth way, she said, in sim simplistic way, she said, Now, how do you think you'll ever get to heaven if you don't love Fred? <laughs> and uh, and, and she, she went on, she said, And what's more, I'm not calling you father anymore. And he said, well, where, do you, where do you get that? She said, let me see your Bible. She, so she turned it over and handed it to him and said, you read that verse so-and-so out loud. It's uh, Matthew 23, whatever verse it is. She said he read it out loud and, and he said out loud, well, I've never seen that before. What, what was it? Call no man on earth, earth father, for you have only one father who is, your, who is your father in heaven. So don't call anyone on earth father. So he said to Manetta, I've never seen that before. She said, well, you didn't want to see it. That's your bread and butter. She said, but Fred wasn't afraid of losing his bread and butter. And she said, he said to her, I've never met anybody like you before. <laughs> oh, but she was just doing her little part in God's big plan. But these churches, they begin to put up walls to the Holy Spirit. And to people who were moved by the Holy Spirit and begin to try to protect their per turf and begin to put up strict parameters around their, their prayer groups. This is what I call institutionalization. An emphasis on organization at the expense of other factors. And this time, there's an emphasis on organization as a reaction trying to protect their man-made denominations and kingdoms. It was also so at this time that they began to emphasize submission to authority. And so pressure was put on these people in these Catholic, no, Catholic, never, Protestant... Never heard it before then. Yeah, I'd never heard it before then either. Pressure was put upon them that they had, they were required by Scripture to stay under the authority of, of, of their leaders. And uh, it was designed to put fear on people to keep them from leaving these churches. And uh, so all of a sudden, this wonderful outpouring of the Holy Spirit, it began to die away. Because, folks, here's, here's, what, here's what I want to say about this. So they applied it not just to church, but to marriage. Yeah, they applied it everywhere. Marriage, church, Christian, everything. Christian turn Christianity into this hierarchical system. This, this legal, hierarchical system, authoritarian system. It's never recovered. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, Sue said it's, the church has never recovered. Well, that's true. It's, the, it's, it's time. Yeah, it's time. It's time. By the way, let me say this. Government, this, this is one thing that has come forth in my new book. I think because the, and you'll hear more about this later, the idea of the founders of America, which, you know, they, they were immigrants from different places, either they or their parents or grandparents. Their idea of government was that government is a necessary evil. I'll say that again. Their idea of government was a necessary evil. So you, you don't give government any more power than it's necessary. It's necessary because in a fallen world, 
There has to be some kind of government because of a fallen world where there is evil. But they had the idea, they believed this, that the more righteous and moral and godly was a, a people, the less government they needed. And that is true. Can you imagine a community where everyone in a city, a community, everyone was absolutely in love with Jesus and committed to live by the golden rule, do unto others as they do unto you? As you would have them do. As you would have do unto others as you would have them do unto you. <laughs> Sorry, I left that part out. <laughs> do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Hey, you wouldn't need very many laws. You would need very hardly any regulations and laws at all. One of the founders, John Adams, said, Our Constitution was made, was designed, the liberties enshrined in the Constitution, he said, was made for a righteous and moral people. It will not work for any other. The more ungodly that a society becomes, the, the, the greater, more stricter government that is needed. And I'll say this, folks, unless America and Canada has a national spiritual awakening that brings a revitalization of right, righteousness and goodness and morality to our nations, we're going to see our freedoms more and more taken away and more and more government and laws and, and restrictions and regulations so revival is not an option for us. It's an absolute necessity. We've got to see it. But the same thing is true in the church. That is why in the New Testament, there is no uh, church government and order that is laid out. What did he just say? I said that in the New Testament, there is no prescribed, order. prescribed government or order that is laid out in the New Testament. See, There are different, you can find different kinds of orders in the New Testament because that wasn't where the emphasis is. Do you realize that in all of Paul's letters that he wrote to churches, with the exception of one, his letter to, to the church at Philippi, he never addresses or even mentions any leaders, leaders or leadership group or any leaders in his letters? He always writes to the entire congregation. And any time there is an emphasis, as there are in some circles today, especially in this whole what some people call the apostolic movement, any time there is this big emphasis on government and order, mm -hmm. it and alignment, they're calling it today, it will destroy, it will squelch, it will quench the work of the Holy Spirit. And people who set them up as authoritarian leaders with, uh, with, with, with great impressive sounding titles, I would say 99% of the time, I don't like, ever like to make blanket statements, but most of the time these are people who are wanting to exercise control and power. And folks, there is nothing that is more detrimental to the free flowing and work of the Holy Spirit than that kind of attitude. And that is exactly the thing that destroyed the charismatic renewal mm -hmm. at the time when it was impacting and bringing together people from all denominations and sects and, 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 and doctrines. What an incredible time it was. So may God help us in this hour. Yes, organization is necessary some organization to help facilitate the work of God. But, but when organization itself becomes the focus and becomes a divine organization, folks, that's when the Holy Spirit is going to be quenched and is going to be driven out. And it happened in the charismatic renewal of the 1960s and 70s. It is so clear in retrospect, that that is what happened. Yes, we want we need to be respectful of one another, 
and be respectful of Christian leaders and, and their churches and so on. But don't ever come under the authoritarian control of some religious institution or, or, or person or whatever. And, 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 and let's, let's believe God. Let's believe God for a fresh move of God's Holy Spirit. And uh, some of you, where you are, God can use you. And you may feel like where you are that you have so little to give. But if you will, like Sister Mineta, the Hallelujah Lady, if you will be faithful, and I know many of you have more to give than she did. You have more talents, more abilities. But if you and all of us will be faithful to do our small part in God's big plan, who knows but what you and I can be the instruments and can play a small part in seeing another great move of the Holy Spirit ignited and, 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 and birthed and brought forth in this our day and our time. And folks, that is the only thing that's going to bring a change to the churches and to our societies and to our nations. So may it be in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Sue, I think you had something there. Yeah, I, I have something, but I don't know that I can articulate it. But maybe if I begin to, to share, you can come in and, and clarify. Because it's something just forming in me based on what you were saying. Yeah. What was it that brought, closed, that, that closed down, that shut down, that flow of the Holy Spirit and the charismatic renewal, what are you saying it was? Control? Control, yeah, control. Okay. Putting strict parameters up and, and, and beginning to, to control and trying to okay. protect their religious turf. Okay. Let's go back a step further and say, what was it in the charismatic renewal that was so life-giving and wonderful? Yeah, there was what, a what, freedom. No, what, it was people were led... You started out with Dennis Bennett. Yes, uh -huh. about him being baptized in the Holy Spirit. He was baptized in the Holy Spirit. And that is, if you like, the doorway into the things of the Spirit. That's true, Sue. Absolutely. That's the doorway. Yep. Okay. Now, that was the key. The, the praise and worship of the Lord Jesus, coupled with the baptism in the Holy Spirit, that made praise come alive. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Okay. But then, that was all closed down by the control right. that was imposed. And it, 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 it withdrew. The Holy Spirit withdrew. Right. He was grieved. Yep. It was grieved away, if you like, although he never leaves us. But his, that, that, that manifestation of his presence was grieved. And so the next wave that came <coughs> wasn't talking about the Holy Spirit. What was the next wave talking about? Oh, the Word. It was talking... No, 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 I'm sorry. Let's... Let's go forward yeah, okay. to a more yeah, okay. current time. Okay. It was talking about the supernatural. No mm -hmm. longer was the were those who wanted more of God, so to speak, talking about the Holy Spirit. They were now talking about anointings and the supernatural. Yeah, and no it's, more did we hear about the Holy Spirit. And it's always dangerous to seek, seek the supernatural apart from the Holy Spirit. And that's exactly what has gripped the current wave right. in the church. That's true, Sue. This pursuit of the supernatural, which, and, and I, I have an understanding now as a result of your sharing tonight why that happened. It was because of the control that shut down the things of right. the Spirit. Mm. But people still wanted the experience of God, so they went into contemplative, meditative things mm. that had nothing right. yeah. whatsoever to do with the Holy Spirit, but had to do with the pursuit of experience. Right, that's true, yeah. In a postmodern era. Very and true. it's got people over the cliff. Yeah, yeah, and absolutely. They're having experiences, but they're not... Biblical experiences. Right. Good and, point. And, you know, I, it all uh, there's a there's a package there that I'm going to have to uh, deal with and, and try to articulate a little better. But are you seeing what I'm saying? I, I'm seeing what you're seeing. Absolutely. And uh, we, we've got to stay with Jesus 
and the Holy Spirit who has come to empower us to lift up Jesus. And the gateway to that is the baptism. The gateway to that is the baptism. Methods designed to lead us into some kind of supernatural encounter with quote unquote the presence. And I remember this in my own life, Sue. I remember I was filled with the Holy Spirit one night, although because it didn't happen like in this Pentecostal church like some people thought it should have. I was discouraged from believing that I had received the baptism in the Spirit. But probably six months later, I was in a service. And uh, this evangelist was preaching. And the message he preached convinced me that six months before, I had received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And I could remember sitting there. And the Word of God put such faith in my heart that I remember sitting there saying, I've got it. I've got it. I don't care what anybody says. I've got it. Now, I had an experience that night I'd never experienced before. And it was a direct result of my faith going out to God. The arm of faith going out and taking hold of that promise of the Father. And making it mine by faith. At the end of this service, it was like what they call revival services. Probably, little church was probably full they invited people to come to the front and pray. They had an altar bench and people would kneel at the altar bench and at the seats and everything. And I remember going down. And again, this had never happened before. It was a result of my reaching out in faith and taking. Because folks, the word receive means to, uh, uh, the, the word receive means to take. It means to reach out and take. It's not passive. It's active. And that's what I did. And I went down to the front at the end of the service and I knelt down and opened my mouth and all of a sudden I could feel those rivers of living water that Jesus talked about when He said, out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. I felt it coming up for the very first time in my life and I opened my mouth and I began to pray in other tongues. And it was the gateway because after that I began to experience the Holy Spirit moving with power on the inside of me. Didn't always know what to do with it. I remember my aunt, my dad's oldest brother's sister, was preaching revival in the church my dad pastored at the time. And she was up preaching. That was not too long after this. And I'm sitting there. She's preaching. And I feel the power, the heat of the Holy Spirit on the inside of me. And, and it, it's, it's a very tangible, powerful sense. And I know that I'm to bring forth a message in tongues. But do I interrupt her right in the middle of her message? Well, you know, what, what do I do with this? And I'm sitting there, Lord, what, what do I do? And all of a sudden, she stopped. Stood there, not saying a word, right in the middle of her sermon. I thought, well, this must be it. So I brought forth the message in tongues. She gave the interpretation, went on and finished her message. Well, since she was staying with us, sitting around the kitchen table after the service that night, I asked her, Aunt Hazel, I was sitting there experiencing this. The, you know, the, and I wasn't sure what to do. She said, yes, well, she said, I was preaching. And she said, all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit told me to be quiet. She said, so I just stopped. I just obeyed Him. Wouldn't it be great <laughs> if preachers would obey the Holy Spirit? <laughs> I wonder how many He's told to be quiet because somebody else had something that needed to be said in the congregation. She said, the Holy Spirit told me to be quiet. So I just stopped. And she said, then you brought forth that message in tongues and I had the interpretation. I knew that was it and went on. Wow. Oh, folks. Yes, the baptism in the Holy Spirit, Sue, so as you said, is, is the doorway into all of the things, the gifts and manifestations of the Spirit. And I want to pray right now in closing. There might be somebody that you've never received this baptism in the Holy Spirit. It's called the promise of the Father. It's His promise. John truly baptized with water. But you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. That's what Jesus said to His disciples when He met with them in one of the post-resurrection appearances. And so they waited there for the promise. And the promise came. And the promise is here. It's not so much begging God to give it is out of a pure heart saying, God, like I did that night, I receive it. I take it by faith. 
And you know, in the book of Acts, they were filled and they were refilled again. I think it's in Acts chapter 4 where they were gathered together and it said as they prayed that the house where they were gathered was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the Word of God with boldness. Amazingly, those that were filled in Acts 4 were the same ones that were filled in Acts 2. Well, why do we need to get filled again? Well, because we could say because we leak. <laughs> we're <cracked. laughs> Clay yeah, pots. we're cracked pots. <laughs> Clay pots. <laughs> we can have these ongoing fillings of the Holy Spirit. And oh, folks, that's the key. That's the key for the church. That's the key for our lives, for our ministries. And I'm afraid that the Holy Spirit has been replaced with, 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 with so much technology, faddish stuff and and programs and, 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 and what have it, I am afraid that the Holy Spirit has been pushed to the corners. But let's receive Him back into the center and make Him the center of our lives and of all that we say and do and let Him know that we absolutely need Him and must have Him. We realize that to carry out God's plan and purpose for our lives. Lord, I thank You tonight. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, pray with me that people will reach out now and, and, and receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Receive a fresh feeling. Maybe you didn't feel before. I pray God will just fill you again with His presence and His power right now. Lord, would You do that everywhere this stream is going as people lift up their hearts and even their hands to You right now. Oh, kila masondra batashi kila masondre. Ela masandra makashande. Ela masondra matashi kimi andabosu. Lord, as people are lifting up their hearts and their hands to you right now, God, I pray right now, in the name of Jesus, I say, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit of the living God. Oh, and just yield your entire being to Him. Yield your tongue to Him. If you've never spoken in that heavenly language, in that, that, that new tongue, just yield your tongue to Him. Just open your mouth and speak and let it flow forth. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Thank You, Lord. I believe You're doing it now. Lord, I believe You're doing it now in Jesus' name. And you know, as the Holy Spirit flows... Healing flows. Because we find in Romans 8.11 it's that same Holy Spirit that raised Christ from the dead who comes in to dwell in us. Oh Lord, thank You right now for Your Holy Spirit filling people, filling lives right now. Thank You Lord for Your Holy Spirit coming in and filling and overflowing in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank You for it Lord. I bless You and I praise You. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Glory to God. Praise your holy name. Praise your holy name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'm just going to turn around and see if there are any emails. But I just want to say, uh, you know, if you're blessed by uh, if you're blessed by these streaming, you've been blessed tonight, we'd love to hear from you. If God's done something, love to hear from you. That's what I was putting on, Sue. Yep, that's exactly what I was putting on. Let the river flow. Oh, that's the key. That's the key. Just let the river flow. How many times have, when we didn't know what to do, the Holy Spirit brought the answer, brought the solution. And He'll do that for you tonight. He's the key. He will bring you. He's come to be everything that Jesus would be if Jesus were here in His physical body. Thank you, Lord. We just believe the Holy Spirit is flowing now. In the name of Jesus. And Holy Spirit bringing life, bringing refreshing, bringing healing everywhere you're flowing. I want to just acknowledge Stormy and her house church is joining us tonight up in Spokane, Washington. And I wonder if there's any of the group from Otter Tail, Minnesota. Any of you all to own tonight? We'd love to hear from you. Praise you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Where the Death and separation Your healing river flows Yes, Lord. 
Bind up wounds within your soul. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise your holy name, Lord. Husbands and wives. Turn the fathers' hearts towards their children. Let the healing river flow. The Holy Spirit is that healing river. 
Uh, just some comments coming in. Uh, uh, our friend uh, Ken out in uh, Northport, Alabama says, Back in the late 70s, I have a thick textbook called Strong Systematic Theology. I did not read a lot, but the one thing that I read and remembered is this. He said on church government that history shows that when there was a strong emphasis on church government and politics, it was usually a sign that no awakening is happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, and you just mentioned you agree with him, and, and I do too. Mm -hmm. And uh, our friend uh, uh, Eva is on tonight. Eva, so glad you're on tonight. God bless you. And uh, she was just had a question about, you, you know, the... the you know, the, the balance, I guess, between a wide open, freewheeling, uh, open freedom and uh, some order and leadership and so on. Uh, yes, as I said, Eva, we're not saying that uh, all organization is bad, but the more selfish people are, the more organization is needed. And in the church, the more mature people are, the less self, selfless, the more selfless they are, and and really wanting God's way and not their own, then then the less government there is that is needed, the less order that is needed. And so I think the ideal is yes, revival. We live in a fallen world. Revival, spiritual awakenings always need some good leadership, pastoral leadership or whatever, but it cannot be the kind of leadership that wants to control everything. It has to be the kind of leadership that wants to nurture, teach, and facilitate uh, what, what the Holy Spirit is doing. And uh, so, yes, there is a certain kind of leadership that is emphasized in the New Testament, and it certainly is not an authoritarian, controlling type of leadership. It's the kind of leadership that facilitates and uh, a selfless, serving type of leadership. And Jesus talked about this very much. So this is so important because, again, probably nothing has quenched revival more than an authoritarian, controlling leadership. And I think this is what happened in the charismatic renewal. In retrospect, I have no question that this is the big thing that quenched the Holy Spirit and uh, caused that whole, that tremendous outpouring of the Holy Spirit to fade, fade from the scene. We were part of a revival in 1984 where one of our friends was actually uh, suspended in the Spirit that's true. Well, the Holy Spirit was just moving, uh, and I'm not going to name names because we have discussed this quite extensively with this person, but it was obvious to most discerning people that that closed down as soon as one person who wanted power began to use it and control it for self. I, I have never seen, Sue, such as that, and you thanks for reminding of an example where somebody... A leader saw the Holy Spirit moving and got involved but tried to use it to advance his own agenda, agenda. And, extend his power. And, and, and to extend his power. And it, it totally destroyed this powerful work of the Holy Spirit that we were part of. We didn't know what was going on. We knew God was working and we were attending these meetings. We just moved from Canada and we both heard the Holy Spirit say to us, Stop giving. And so we were obedient. We did. And at that time, this 3,000 seat auditorium was packed out every night. Uh, there was a front page uh, 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 article. They were the featured article in, in an uh, issue of Charisma magazine. Their pictures on the front page. It's back in 1984. I mean, it seemed like, man, this, this was the going thing. But God said to us, stop giving. And uh, it was because the person who was the leader had never died to self, never died to his own ego and personal agendas and, and desires for importance and power. And he saw this powerful move of the Holy Spirit. As Sue said, our friend who was a, a teacher in the Bible school when it broke out, that morning she was suspended, couldn't move for some time. <laughs> and here, tell it, it's funny. 
She could see the clock on the wall. And, the, and this school is being broadcast by live satellite all over, all over the world. And she says, she's talking to God. She says, God, it's time for me to go teach. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. We'll have her over uh, one of these times. And maybe we can get her to talk a little bit more about this. But here was this person. Saw what was happening and tried to use it. Tried to take control of it. Totally destroyed it. And that whole ministry does not even exist today. Even the buildings. Huge complex. The buildings, everything is gone. Folks, it's dangerous to try to use and control the Holy Spirit. And what is needed in the church today is for us to just totally yield ourselves to Him. Lord, use us. You have come, Holy Spirit, to advance God's kingdom. And we yield ourselves to You to be used by You to do our small part in Your big plan. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Uh, order your book. Yeah, so if any. How they can pre order your book. It should be available in what, two to three weeks? Uh, yeah, it should be, uh, I would say probably three weeks, Sue. And you have what, $600 towards $2,000? have 500 towards 2000 And the rest is coming in. In Jesus', in name. Jesus name. Hallelujah. Uh, I, I just wanted to mention this. One of the things in researching this I discovered, and, and this is probably true in other nations too, to a degree. But the founders who had a very pronounced Christian worldview, a reformist worldview, that was distrustful of fallen human nature, that the reason they divided the American governmental system up into different groupings, two different legislative bodies, a judicial body, an executive an executive branch, all these different branches, and then there are other things worked in too to keep any one person or group from obtaining absolute or too much power because they had a distrust of human nature. Their view of the fall was, and this is important in, in relation to what we're talking about tonight and, and revival, Humanity had been created as a noble creature in the image and likeness of God. But in the fall, when Adam and Eve declared their independence from God and turned from God, that image was marred. It was not erased, but it was marred. Now, that image is restored through Jesus Christ, but in this life it is a process called sanctification. And it is never completely finished in this life. We are continually in this life growing in the grace of Christ, being changed from glory to glory. And so in this life, we never experience the complete restoration of that image. And so their idea was that humanity, even Christian humanity, in this present condition cannot be trusted with absolute power. And that's why they divided it up. And folks, this is true in the church too. Church history bears this out. So-called Christian leaders, when they've had absolute power, have been as tyrannical as anybody else. I think it was Lord Acton who said, power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. And so what we need are not people seeking importance and power. But people who are willing to put their lives on the altar, give it all to Jesus, die to self, and let the Holy Spirit come and do His thing and do His work in our lives. Yeah, this is on my website. If anybody wants to pre-order it, it is on my website. Eva says uh, they want it when they have a little more coming in, but we'll remember that they want Sure, absolutely. They want them. Absolutely. Uh, you might explain too, Eddie, this stuff. I think it's their first time to be on, so um, it, it might be helpful if you explain that this interaction is, a, is an important part of what we do. Yeah. Questions and, and comments are welcome. Yeah, yeah. Questions and comments are welcome. This interaction is a part of what we do. It's important. This is what Paul did in the great revival in Ephesus. He didn't just preach sermons. The, Bible, the word that says there, that it says that he dialogued daily. Some translations say he lectured, he taught. 
But the Greek word says that he dialogued daily in Ephesus for two years. And as a result, all of Asia heard the word of the Lord. Oh, there's our friend uh, Margaret in, uh, in Ireland. She says, Eddie and Sue, thank you both and the Holy Spirit for our wonderful teaching. We desperately need the Holy Spirit today. Who knows what God will do when we look to Him? I feel it in my heart that something is about to burst. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I have a question for you, Margaret, that's been coming to me now for about oh, several days. What do you want to say to Ireland? What does Margaret want to say to Ireland? Boy, will you think about that? Will you pray about that? I, 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 I concur, Sue. I believe Margaret has a word for Ireland. Write it down, Margaret. What do you want to say to Ireland? Hallelujah. Thank you, Margaret. Appreciate, appreciate that. Oh, and our friend Soma Kovur, who is a native of India but is here in the, uh, the DFW area, she says, uh, thank you once again for a good message. It has been such a blessing. Please pray for my son, Vinny. Uh, so far, he, he's at the University of Texas at Austin. He says, please pray for him again today. He's a sweet boy and loves the Lord, but came under a bondage. Well, some of we agree with you in the name of Jesus for Vinny. And, and, and whatever this bondage is, we speak to this bondage and we say, be broken, be removed off of Vinny in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we pray that by Your Spirit, You will give Biddy the substance that he needs in his heart by the Holy Spirit to stand against and to, to res resist and to stand against whatever is coming against him. Help him to see that he is an overcomer through Christ and through the power of His Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise You, Father. Praise You, Father. Paul Kenny says, Eddie. He doesn't want you to read. He's sharing a personal experience, but he doesn't feel it would be wise to okay. share it generally. Okay, right, right. But he does say that at, when those words would come to him, he felt a fire or burning in his belly that the word had to come out. Mm -hmm. That's why Eddie's story reminded me of these words in the past. We'll do it again, Lord. Amen. Lord, yes, Lord. Yes, in the name of Jesus, let, let's pray right now. Uh, Sue, I know you have talked about when you were first baptized in the Spirit. We talked about this I last week. I went to Bible school, uh, and, and it was in Bible school that that was quenched. You, 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 would feel the pow you would feel the power of God come up in your hands. Very, very strong. And, uh, but it got quenched through controlling, through controlling leadership. It got quenched. And so, Father, there are people out there tonight, they've, they've had things quenched. And so I'm, I'm believing, Sue, yeah, let's take the lid off. all over. We take the lid off. Lord, let, let gifts of the Holy Spirit. Some people, Lord, they have, they have been hurt. They've been damaged by controlling, by abusive leadership. And they've been quenched in their spirits. And Lord, I pray tonight that You will revive Your work in our hearts. <laughs> Oh, God, revive your work in the midst of the years. You know, I was just seeing that passage in a new way. That is, is a prayer. Oh, Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. Revive thy work. Where is his work? His work is in our hearts. Lord, revive thy work in the hearts of your people tonight. Lord, gifts that have been quenched and have, been, have lain dormant, Lord, let them be revived again. In the name of Jesus. And let them begin to flow by the power of Your Holy Spirit. Thank You for doing it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. You know, Eddie, uh, in an effort today uh, for people to be able to you know, kind of do these gifts, what they do is they, they have classes where they learn to give prophecies. They practice prophesying. That's the, ex the very opposite from the way the Holy Spirit works. Oh, absolutely. When Paul talks about that burning that was in his belly, that God's Word was there as a fire to come forth. That fire... And it wasn't something He controlled. No, and the same with my experience. Right. I didn't have to have someone teach me how 
to have power in my hands. It was something God initiated, and my job was simply to release that. Yeah, to flow with it. Amen. Yeah, absolutely. That's the difference between so much of what's happening right. today and what is needed and what is biblical. So, so God, refresh, restore. It, it, it's because there's too much so the emphasis, too much man-centered, human-centered. We want to control everything. And uh, so we'll learn how to do it. We'll teach people how to, to prophesy, how to do these things. Uh, it doesn't work, my friends. It doesn't work. These things come forth as the Holy Spirit wills. And I tell you, when He brings it forth, my, it's powerful and, and, and incredible things do happen. Well, let me see if there's anybody else that I missed. Uh, so glad... You are all on tonight. If we missed your email, send another one. Uh, because I think I mentioned... Oh, there's Ildi. Ildi, God bless you, Ildi in Pensacola. God bless you, Ildi. She just telling us how blessed she is by the streaming. I wonder if Joel and Marilyn heard anything that registered with them tonight. Remember starting out... Joel said something about they were waiting. For oh, for that word from heaven. Well, Joel, did you hear that word from on high tonight? <laughs> Joel and Marilyn, God bless you. Uh, uh, just a lovely couple out in the, uh, Savannah. We haven't seen in years, but I believe our paths are going to cross Jan again. Jan has been on from Calgary. She came on right at the beginning. Calgary, yeah. Jan, I'll bet it's cold in Calgary tonight. God bless you, Jan. Our prayers are with you, and we know God's doing good things. Are you in the chat room? Uh, no. Uh, People who haven't been to the chat room may be interested. I Ildi said, uh, said she also liked your comments about the Holy Spirit's presence very much, Sue. Yeah. She says, I agree. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Yeah, there's our friend Rhonda up in Colorado in the prayer room. And, um, oh, uh, and from Otter Tail, our friends in Otter Tail, Sue, they said they'd like to see you on camera sometime. Oh. Uh, well, we'll we'll uh, we'll do you that. All come down and do all the technical stuff, and then I'll be free. Right, right. She said, "You all come down and do the technical stuff, and she'll be free." Oh, Cody, Cody Sloan from Ottertail. He's headed to Ireland in September, oh. uh, leading a group of worshippers and prayer warriors to experience God's creation and to bless the land. Well, Cody, God bless you all. Where Where are you going? Cody? Yeah, Cody, let us know where you're going. Uh, we would We would love to know where you're going because. We, we have a lot of people on here uh, from Ireland. Uh, Rondon, Colorado, there's our friend uh, Barbara up in Oshawa and Sandy in North Carolina. Steve in Nashville. Steve, just believing that God is touching you. And Cheryl, Cheryl uh, uh, up in uh, Missouri. Cheryl, did, were you able to get on tonight? I hope you were. Um, Cheryl Skid. Cheryl Skid, yeah. Glory to God. And can. And in the prayer room. And God bless you. So glad you, you got on with us tonight. And God is doing good things. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, God is so good. God is so good. We'll just have a, a little Thanksgiving here in closing. What do we go out with that? And we'll, okay, we'll go out with that song. Let the healing river flow. And... Uh, Richard uh, was on earlier. Richard in uh, Holyoke. Uh, in Holyoke. Yes, Richard was on in the prayer room earlier. I assume you're on. Richard, are you still out there? Thank you, Jesus. Oh, our friend uh, Faye in Australia there is on soon. Hi, Faye. And uh, Gladys. Oh, hi, Gladys. Gladys, so glad you're on too in Tulsa. Gladys said she could only get the video this week. She couldn't pick up the audio. So maybe next week she'll have the full thing. Lillian and Tiara up in uh, Thunder Bay, I think, may be on. I, uh, they were in the prayer room earlier. Are you guys still on, Lillian and Tiara? God bless you up in Thunder Bay, Ontario. And Lord, we thank you right now. Thank you for all our friends out there. And we believe that your river is flowing. Your, your Holy Spirit river is flowing in Jesus' name. Let it flow. Let it flow. Let it flow. 
Let the healing river flow. Oh, gracious God, we cry to you. Let the healing river flow. Yes, thank you, Jesus. So Cheryl said she made it in this time. Big river flow. Gracious God, we cry to you. Cody Sloan up in Ottertail, Minnesota has uh, posted their travel itinerary in Ireland, and I see they're going to be in Dublin and Galway, some of the places where Sue and I were. And uh, so some of our friends in Ireland, if you want to check out and see where they're going to be and uh, make contact with them, there's uh, it's posted here in the prayer room, and if you're not in the prayer room, can't get to it, uh, well, I'll be happy to uh, send it to you. Okay, well, it's been a good evening. God is on the move. And why not let God use us? 
doing our little part in his big plan to ignite, to be instruments, to ignite another spiritual awakening. 